Okay, this is the start of our evolution unit, and we are going to begin by talking, talking about the principles of natural selection. And I have an excellent website I'm going to link for you guys. It's a great reference as we move through this unit if you have any questions at all. So first, we have got to define evolution because this is such a misunderstood concept. Evolution is the process of biological change in populations over time that makes descendants genetically different from their ancestors. Okay, so that sounds complicated, but it's a lot simpler than it sounds. We're looking at change in populations, so groups of organisms that live together in the same place. And what we're seeing is that Frogs, for instance, in a certain pond that lived hundreds of years ago look different genetically on a genetic standpoint from frogs that live in that pond right now. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. And in general, we can kind of categorize evolution into two types. There's micro, which is on a small scale looking at, like I just said, like a single population of frogs in a specific area, like a certain pond. And then there's also macro evolution. evolution. So that's looking at large scale evolution where we're looking at how a species has changed across populations living in different places over time. A couple of key things. Evolution is considered the unifying theme of biology. We're going to see this in later concepts. It ties in evidence that we've learned from so many different subfields of biology. And it's also important to note that Darwin is not the person who came up with evolution. He is the person who came up with a mechanism to explain how it occurred. For hundreds and hundreds of years, scientists and biologists have been observing evolution happening, but not knowing how. Darwin just provided an explanation for how it is happening. And this is really important. I also want to remind you from Unit 1 that um, evolution is, evolutionary theory is a theory, but in science, a theory is an explanation of why something happens based on scientific evidence. So this is not just a random guess. There's a lot of scientific evidence to back it up, and I'll be sharing that with you as well. So very brief review of what was believed pre-Darwin, um, coming up with natural selection for how evolution occurred. Um, we have an activity where we're going to go into this in more detail in class. So there's creationism, which is just the belief that God created everything. Um, there it is. Um, catastrophism, which um, was this scientist named Cuvier, um, it has a big tie to um, just the study of geology and changes in Earth's crust. And he's just the one that really noticed, as he studied fossils, that there were a lot of differences between um, fossils and existing species. So there's a lot of change that had happened. Um, Hutton also looked at geology and um he kind of had an alternative idea to Cuvier called gradualism, which again, I'm not going into these in detail because we covered them in the activity in class. Um, Thomas Malthus, though, he came up with the first um, theory that is closest to what Darwin came up with, which is a struggle for existence. He saw that organisms could have a lot more kids, a lot more offspring than they actually do. Um, there's just not enough resources, so there's this struggle for existence that creates competition based on the availability of resources, which is a key tenet of natural selection. Um, uniformitarianism was an idea come up by Charles Lyell. Again, looking at kind of Earth's process. The main thing about Lyell is that he was the first to say Earth is actually not just thousands of years old, it's millions of years old. So he was the first to say that Earth's really, 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 really old. Now, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck um, is probably one of the most famous he came up with this theory of inheritance of acquired traits. He basically thought that species evolved by using things and then disusing them. So, for example, a giraffe got such a long neck because it would stretch its neck and then over time it would pass on it would so that it could eat more food. It would pass on then its stretched neck to its offspring and then its offspring would have a stretched neck. So that's kind of what he predicted. 
Um, we know this isn't true though, because you can't, you don't change your genetics by how you choose to live your life per se. I mean, we're not going to get into epigenetics here, but consider I have brown hair. That is my genetics in me are for brown hair. I could dye my hair hot pink, but if I got pregnant with hot pink hair, I would not give birth to a baby with hot pink hair because dyeing my hair did not change my genes that are saying brown hair. And so that is where we can kind of disprove Lamarck's theory here. And then intelligent design is similar to creationism, but it doesn't put the label per se of God on it, but it's basically saying that things are too complex to have just been by chance. There must be some sort of intelligent designer, greater power that designed things. So these are kind of all the different theories that have been thrown about him before. Then comes Darwin. Remember, he did not come up with evolution. His scientific studies, though, came up with a mechanism that explained how evolution could occur. He was a naturalist. He loved studying nature. He went on a voyage to the Galapagos Islands, and we have a great story we're going to read about him in class. But basically, he studied all the different species that looked there, and he looked at, or that lived there, and he saw the ones that lived on these different islands, and they had specific characteristics that helped them survive for their specific island, but then they also had these similarities. And from analyzing these species, what he came up with was this mechanism for evolution called natural selection. And so here's what I want you to write. Natural selection says that organisms with the best traits, which are called adaptations, will live longer and reproduce more than other organisms. Thus, over time, we're going to see changes in the population because traits that are better will be inherited more and passed on more. And guys, this sounds complicated, but it's not. It's known as survival of the fittest, where fitness is just a measure of how well you can survive in your environment. So all this is saying, natural selection is saying this. If you have better traits than other organisms, that will allow you to survive longer. You will live longer. And if you're living longer, you're going to reproduce more. So your genes are going to become more common in the offspring that exists. So if this keeps happening over time in a population, we should see in that population that better traits, more fit traits become more common over time. That nature is going to select out the best ones and we're going to see a change in the population over time. And this is based on four principles that make this able to happen. Overproduction of offspring, variation, adaptation, and descent with modification. So I will talk through each of those now for you. Okay, so first is this idea of overproduction of offspring. This connects back to what Malthus was saying with the struggle for existence. There are way more offspring than there are resources, and thus this creates competition. So there is this struggle for existence that creates competition that makes some organisms come off then as better and others as worse. There can't be natural selection to choose a more fit if there isn't a better and a worse in a competition to prove that. Next, he's all variation. There have to already be differences in the physical traits of organisms that would make some better and some worse. And these come from a lot of different places. They come, mainly our ultimate source is random mutations. So just random mutations that happen that make some organisms have different traits than others. Think about this. Asexual reproducers like bacteria, that's the only way that they're going to create any variation because they don't do meiosis. Because this is another way that we get variation. Just how the, um, the genes like one are crossing over that could happen in prophase one, but also two, just how they assort themselves, which ones get passed on in the egg, which end up getting fertilized. Just sexual reproduction in general creates variation. And then last migration, which um, from an evolution and genetic standpoint is known as gene flow. When new organisms move in and if they're sexual reproducers and they reproduce with the organisms that live somewhere, they're going to introduce new genes. So for example, thinking about the United States of America, before we had, you know, pioneers coming over here and tr taking over our country, we had the indigenous people that lived in America, and then we introduced all these different genes from the other side of the pond, if you will, and then that created a ton of variation. 
So variation is key. Another key principle is this idea of adaptation, which I had mentioned. And adaptation is a feature or a trait that an organism has that makes them better at surviving in their environment. And so what we should see is that beneficial traits with these adaptations will become more common over time because those organisms are living longer and thus reproducing more. So here I have a picture of a cactus. And so think about plants that live in environments like deserts that are very dry. Plants that, there's going to naturally be variation in the plants that live there. Some are going to naturally, in their genes, whether it's due to mutation or whatever, be able to retain water and uh, than others will. Those that, can't have, that don't have some sort of mechanism for retaining water are not going to live very long in that kind of environment, and so they will not be passing on their, their traits to offspring because they won't be able to reproduce as much. As organisms that do have these natural traits that were in their genes that allow them to retain water better, they will live longer and as they should pass that on more so that over time when we're looking at the populations of plants that live there, we'll see plants that are able to retain water as more common. So this is changing the gene pool, the combined alleles of all the individuals in the population. That's what's changing over time. And we can quantify this. I'm not going to make you calculate it in this class, but um, this is quantifiable. So we, can, we have math to back this up. And then last we see descent with modification. So when we're looking at a gene's frequency over time, meaning how common it is in a population, we're going to see that change. So that descendants are modified. Descendants are different from their ancestors. So natural selection is leading, leads to populations that have new phenotypes that are adapted to new situations. But these traits just don't come from anywhere. They come from their ancestors. They're inherited. And again, I said this before, but beneficial traits should be becoming more common over time because you're living longer and thus reproducing more. Thus, your genes are becoming more common in the gene pool. Very, very, very important. I want you to hear me screaming this at you. Individuals do not evolve. Populations do. Think back to my hair principle. I cannot change my genes for my hair color. Just dyeing my hair does nothing to my genes. That's I, as an individual organism, cannot evolve biologically. But the population of humans that lives in the United States of America can change because we can look at the overall frequency of genes. And let's say we're looking at the frequency of genes in the population of people that lived here prior to you know, colonization of Europeans coming over here. The indigenous people in general were, had more common darker skin, darker hair, and darker eyes. Then you had all of these non-dark-skinned people, these European people coming over with blonde hair and blue eyes and fair skin, and they introduced new genes to the population. So the population changed, the individuals did not. That is so, so, so critical. So in class, we're going to stop and we're just going to look at this and do a lab so that you can understand this a little better. But for the sake of notes, I'm going to keep pressing in to some different mechanisms of microevolution. So for the scope of our class, we're really going to be looking at evolution on a micro scale. So looking at it on a small scale, just at small populations, we're not going to be looking at you know, the evolution of entire species over millions of years per se. So a couple of things that cause microevolution on a small scale are mutations, natural selection, which we've already talked about, genetic drift, gene flow, and non-random mating or sexual selection. So I'm going to highlight each of these, and then we'll be done with um, concept one. So like I mentioned, mutations cause microevolution. If you remember from our cells unit, a mutation and genetics unit, a mutation is just any change in a DNA sequence. And what it does is a mutation introduces a new genotype to the population and thus a new phenotype. So if your genes are different, then most likely that physical trait, the phenotype, is going to be different as well. And then this changes the allele frequency in a population. So how common is that allele if a new gene is introduced? Increases in variation are a driving force of evolution. Evolution, again, Natural selection, it cannot happen without 
variation, overproduction of offspring, adaptations, these principles that we were just talking about. So this is critical. And remember, a mutation, it can be harmful, but it can also be beneficial, or it can just be neutral. It can kind of have no effect. And so that's really important. Every population inherently has some sort of mutation and thus some sort of variation. Okay, next we talked about natural selection. It's just organisms that are more fit for their environments will survive and reproduce more offspring. So beneficial traits should become more common over time. Um, this is what we saw with Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands and how they had certain traits for their specific environments in the islands they lived on. Okay, a new mechanism I haven't mentioned yet is genetic drift. This is a random change in the frequency of alleles in a population over time. And typically what we'll see with genetic drift is that a rare allele in a population is going to decrease in how common it is, while other alleles will increase over time. And this often actually increases and in, results in a loss of genetic variation. And we tend to see this happening in smaller populations. So, for example... Let's say we have this population of roses in a garden. And when you're looking at this picture, 80% of these roses are red and 20% are white. But let's say there's some sort of random event that occurs that only these three roses are able to reproduce, you know, for several seasons. So what we may see over time is that now the population, there's only 70% are, are red and 30% are white. Well, then there's some other sort of random event that happens. And for one season or a couple of seasons, only these three flowers are able to reproduce. Over time, we may see that all of the white are eliminated. And it's, you know, it wasn't necessarily because being red was better than being white. It's just for whatever reason, these are the only ones that had the resources that made it possible for them to reproduce, and so we saw this happen over time. Again, if you have a large population, it's going to kind of prevent this happening, but it's, this can really happen in smaller populations. For example, the founder effect, um, we see this in Amish populations in America, which are, um, we see this great loss of genetic diversity when you have a small group of people move or uh, organisms move and isolate themselves to create a new population and then they're only reproducing within each other, it creates a, a loss of genetic diversity. And then there can also be a population bottleneck too, which um, I'm not going to get into, but this can happen in especially in smaller populations. And it can cause evolution, which again, is just biological change in populations over time. Okay, gene flow I mentioned earlier also because it creates variation and thus that can, that's a mechanism for evolution. Gene flow is just the movement of genes into and out of a population, and it occurs during migration, and it causes an increase in genetic variation. Okay, so let's say we have two islands. One island, all the beetles are yellow, and one, all the beetles are blue. Okay, so let's say I'm out fishing, and um, I, I dock on an island, and some of the blue beetles, I don't even notice. They get on my fishing boat. Then I go back to my original island, the blue beetles crawl off my boat, they get on the island, and they start reproducing with the other yellow beetles that are there. I've now introduced new genes to this population, and variation has occurred, and thus microevolution can be driven. So this is an example of that. And then last but not least, this might be my favorite because it's just truly fascinating, is sexual selection, which can also be referred to as non-random mating. So this is the selection of traits there are the favoring of traits that don't necessarily help you survive, but without them, you're not able to reproduce because no one wants to reproduce with you, so your genes aren't able to be passed on. One of the most fascinating examples of this is the male peacock. Female peacocks have brown feathers. They aren't pretty at all. The males have evolved to have this outrageous display of feathers in order to attract females. So even though having these feathers definitely doesn't help the male peacock survive, they need them in order to get the females to reproduce with them so that they can pass on their traits. So sexual selection is not nature selecting what is most fit, but sex selecting. Like favoring traits that allow you to have more sex, basically. And then this bird is also super fascinating to me, the long-tailed widow bird. These males have evolved these extremely long tail feathers to attract females, even though this actually does not help them get away from predators faster. And we have a great video watching class about this.
So if you're listening to all this and you're saying, well, there's no way this is always happening. You can't prove it. There's no math. There is math that provides evidence that this is happening. And it's because of genetic equilibrium. So genetic equilibrium, which I'll fix that typo. I'm so sorry. Which is also known as the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or Hardy-Weinberg principle for the guys that came up with it. Genetic equilibrium would be there would be no change in the allele frequencies in a population over time, meaning evolution is not occurring if a population is in genetic equilibrium. There's no change. Now, the only way for this to happen is for none of those mechanisms of microevolution to be able to happen, meaning a population has to be large so that genetic drift can't happen. There has to be random mating, so no sexual selection. Everyone just mates entirely randomly with no preferences so that nothing is favored sexually. There can be no migration so that no new traits are introduced. There can be no mutations so that no new traits are introduced. And there can be no natural selection. There has to be enough resources so that everyone gets what they need, so there's no competition, so everyone lives and reproduces as long as they can. If even one of these conditions is not met, then the population is considered to be evolving. And again, there's math to back this up. I can give you some demos in class. But we're going to look at this and do some simulations so you can understand it a little bit better. But that is our general overview of the principles of natural selection.